Hello everyone, my name is Nagura and today I have a Moonkin guide for you. I know a lot of people have been waiting for a Moonkin guide. I did want to wait a little bit to do a more in-depth Moonkin guide because there's still possible changes that are going to be happening to Moonkin, like tuning changes, general changes to gear and to tier set and whatever. But this guide that I'm making here is supposed to be more of a introduction guide, a little bit more of a basic guide for people that are new to Moonkin or that don't know about the changes that happened in Dragonfly and just want to get a basic idea of how Moonkin works. All right, first of all, let's talk about the positive things about Moonkin and the negative things about Moonkin. So you can see if you want to play the spec or if you want to switch to something else, if you don't like what you're going to hear. All right, so the positive things about Moonkin is that we are probably the only class in the game that has such a huge spread out AoE potential. Because of our Starfall, there's such a huge radius, almost no other class in the game has the possibility to do that. So whenever you are in a situation where spread out AoE would actually be needed, then Moonkin is by far the best uh, choice you can have, usually. Then, we are pretty versatile in our damage profile, so um, we can pretty much do everything except burst AoE. Burst AoE is something that we are not very good at, but everything else we can really do. We can do single target, we can hit uh, spread out targets, we can hit stacked targets, we can switch to other targets uh, whenever we want, and so on. Then we have good utility and movement. We have lots and lots of utility spells in our druid class tree. We gained Mark the Wild, so now we have a class buff as well in addition. And we also have really good mobility with our uh, wild charge, with our dash, with our stampeding war, and so on. Then another Thing that I did want to mention is that uh, we have a cool looking Moonkin form that can flap, which no one else can do. And then we also have pretty cool animations and a really nice class fantasy that revolves around solar and lunar and eclipse. And a lot of people are really happy with how spells look, I have these huge uh, full moons and these stars falling from the sky. So if that's something that you're interested in, then Moonkin would be for you as well. Then let's go over some of the negative things that Moonkin unfortunately has. Number one, we are bad at burst AoE, as I already mentioned before. The second negative point already ties into this a little bit is that we have high ramp time. So if things die really quickly, no matter if it's lots of targets or few targets, we're not going to be as good as other classes. Other classes have buttons they press and their damage happens instantaneously. We don't have that. We have to put our dots up, we have to get some astral power, we have to go into our eclipse. And it just takes some time to do that. So that is our downside for sure. Then our CDs are not as strong. This is a huge difference to what Moonkin used to be in Shadowlands. But now in Dragonflight, our cooldowns are not as strong anymore. And if that is something that is required in a certain encounter, so let's say there's a really important phase where you use Bloodlust and use all of your cooldowns, then Moonkin is not going to be as good as other classes that have much stronger cooldowns than we do. And then another negative point is the position of Solar Beam in our spec tree. It is in a position that is pretty unfortunate to get. So if you want Solar Beam for M plus or something like that, then you will have to put some points into talents that you don't really want to take, which uh, can feel not so great. Hopefully they change this. Please blister them back. All right, let's go over basic abilities. So our basic abilities, if you don't consider talents whatsoever, is Wrath, Starfire, Moonfire, Sunfire, Star Search, and Star Fall. Now, Sunfire and Moonfire are incredibly important. They're our dots because they uh, increase our damage to the targets with our new mastery that we have in Dragonflight. So your Sunfire increases nature damage on the target and our Moonfire increases arcane damage onto our target. Wrath and Starfire are our filler spells, so they generate astral power for us. And as I said, Wrath does nature damage and Starfire actually does arcane damage. So they are buffed by our dots as well. And they're also in addition buffed by our eclipse. Wrath also does only singular damage to the target that you're hitting, while Starfire actually has a splash effect. So if you're targeting a mob with Starfire, it also does additional splash damage around the target as well. Then our resource is called Astral Power, and you generate it with a variety of abilities. One of them I already mentioned, Wrath and Starfire. Then our dots are also generating astral power, and then there's also some of our talents that will give us astral power generation as well. Then you can spend your astral power on Star Search and Starfall. Those are our astral power spenders. Starfall is the AoE ability that is this huge radius around your character, and Star Search is a single target astral power hit that does only damage to the target that you're using it on. 
Then let's uh, talk about astral damage. Astral damage is the combination of arcane and nature damage. This means that every ability that does astral damage actually benefits from both nature damage increases and arcane damage increases. So since our sunfire, for example, increases our nature damage done to the target, and our moonfire increases our arcane damage done to the target, a spell that only does nature damage will only benefit from the sunfire, while our arcane damage only benefits from the moonfire, but our astral damage, for example, star search and starfall, they benefit from both and it adds up. So if you have a 10% nature damage increase and a 10% arcane damage increase, then your astral spells do 20% more damage, but your nature damage only do 10% more damage and your arcane spells only do 10% more damage. Our basic rotation revolves around our Eclipse system. Basically, if you cast two filler spells, so Wrath or Starfire, then you enter the opposite Eclipse. If you cast two Wraths, you will enter Lunar Eclipse for 15 seconds, and if you cast two Starfires, you will enter Solar Eclipse for 15 seconds. Solar Eclipse is our nature damage eclipse that increases our nature damage done and if you're in your lunar eclipse you will get more arcane damage done keep in mind that astral damage benefits from both nature and arcane damage increases so for starfall and for star surge it doesn't actually matter if you're in your solar eclipse or in your lunar eclipse it doesn't matter for that damage but of course if you're in solar eclipse only your wrath gets buffed and not your starfire and if you're in lunar eclipse only your starfire gets buffed and not your wrath now i'm going to quickly go over some talent builds because this is supposed to be more of a basic guide so i'm not going to go over all of the talents and explain why and what i'm doing i'm just going to show you a build basically and i will explain why certain things are really important and why other things not so important. All right, so I've circled the talents that are really important that you should be going for for a single target in red. These talents in the spectry, of course, they give you the most damage and you should almost always go with those talent points. Keep in mind that this can change still. So at the moment, this is what it looks like, right? The red talents, definitely pick them up on single target. I also circled some talents in the class tree with red circles because those also give you damage, even though a lot of the talents in the class tree do not give you damage, but there's very few that do. So make sure you pick those up. Then I circled some of the talents in green in the spec tree, and those talents are currently the best talents for a single target, but they are not giving you an insane amount of damage increase. So if you want to switch them up for something else, you can totally do so. And again, this might change, so keep that in mind. But if you don't like some of those green talents that are circled, you're totally fine to go with another talent, and you're not going to be losing like an insane amount of damage, so you're totally fine to do that. Then I circled some talents in purple. Purple is pure utility and you're totally free to use whatever talents you want. You don't have to go with the talents that I circled with purple. I circled them because in my opinion, they're the most useful ones in almost any kind of situation. Like no matter if you do raids or in plus or whatever it may be you're doing, they're almost always useful. The talents that I selected but did not circle with purple, they're less important and you can skip them if you want to go with something else because it's very situational, right? Sometimes you need a curse to spell, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you need hibernate or typhoon and sometimes you don't. So definitely switch up your utility depending on what you need. All right, now I'm quickly going to go over a single target opener that you would be doing if you have the talents that I have selected here. And keep in mind, this is without four piece bonus. This is without the tier set four piece bonus. All right, so initially you will cast two rafts on the pool timer because Wrath has a travel time. So you can cast it on max range before the pool timer hit zero. You can, depending on your haste levels, you can already start casting at around two seconds even before the boss gets pulled because it takes quite a long time for a raft to travel. So you cast two rafts before the boss gets pulled. Then once the boss gets pulled, you apply your moonfire, your sunfire, and your stellar flare. Then you immediately use your cooldowns. No matter if you're in an eclipse already or not, it doesn't matter. You don't have to enter solar or lunar eclipse first. You just press your cooldowns as soon as you've applied your dots. Then you press Fury of a Loon. And then you continue your normal rotation. So it's a pretty easy opener. Free cast your rafts, put your dots up, cast your cooldowns with your potion, with your trinket, with everything, cast Fury of a Loon, and then use your normal rotation. Now, how does the normal rotation work? So of course you want to keep your dots up. Sunfire, Moonfire, and Stellar Flare. You want to keep those up all the time. Then you want to use your Astral Power to cast Star Surges on single target, of course. And you want to make sure you use the Star Surges inside an Eclipse. 
and preferably inside your double eclipse. Of course, if you have your celestial alignment or a pulsar proc, you will be in both lunar and solar eclipse at the same time, and this would be the preferred situation to cast your astral damage star surge because, of course, it will be buffed by both the eclipses. But, of course, do not overcap astral power. So if you're currently in lunar eclipse and it's still quite a long time until your cooldowns are ready or your pulsar procs, then you use your star surges inside lunar eclipse or inside solar eclipse, depending on what you're in. Then you want to maximize your eclipse up time. And this is a bit awkward. Currently, we go into lunar eclipse on single target. We didn't do this in the past. In the past, we went into solar eclipse for single target because our wrath was more beneficial to cast than our starfire. But with the new talent system that we have, we have so many talents that um, buff entering and exiting eclipses. For example, we have Solstice, we have Balance of All Things, we have Nature's Grace that gives us haste whenever we exit Eclipse. So because we have a bunch of talents that really give us more things and more buffs whenever we enter and exit an Eclipse, we want to maximize our Eclipse uptime. And the way you maximize your Eclipse uptime is by entering Lunar Eclipse instead of Solar Eclipse. Because you enter Lunar Eclipse by casting two rafts, which is a lot faster than casting two Starfires to enter Solar Eclipse. So therefore, currently, as it stands, if you're hitting one target, you will enter Lunar Eclipse on single target. So that means you will cast two rafts to enter Lunar. Once you are inside Lunar, you will cast Starfire as your filler spell. But as soon as you're out of the Eclipse, you cast two rafts again to enter Lunar again. Then you only cast Starfire inside your Lunar Eclipse if you don't have anything else to do. So if you don't have to Star Surge, you don't have to apply your dots, you don't have to cast uh, any sort of cooldowns, then you cast Starfire as like the last thing you do. And if you're inside your CDs, so if you're inside your Celestial Alignment or your Pulsar Procs or your Incarnation, then you will cast Wrath as your filler spell. Because Wrath is still more beneficial to cast on one single target if you have Solar Eclipse up. It's just better to go into Lunar Eclipse because you want to maximize your Eclipse uptime. So if you are in Lunar and in Lunar only, you cast Starfire. If you're in both Eclipses at the same time, you cast Wrath on a single target. Then, you use your Fear of a Loon on cooldown, you use your Incarnation on cooldown, or whenever it makes sense for the boss fight. And additionally, you want to make sure you cast your Star Surges at the start of an Eclipse rather than at the end of the Eclipse. Because we have Balance of All Things, which gives us crit whenever we enter an Eclipse, that decreases very rapidly. And additionally, we want to stack up our Star Lord as well, which is a 15 seconds buff. So that is the exact amount of time that our Eclipse is up. So you try to pool Astro Power, then you enter Eclipse and you spend your Astro Power to stack up your Star Lord. So three Star Surges to stack up your Star Lord, plus make use of your Balance of All Things. And then you just try a little bit to keep up your Rattle the Stars, but it's not important at all. Do not focus on Rattle the Stars if it um, confuses you or if you would do something else wrong. But Rattle the Stars is just like something that you have, but completely ignoring it is also not a big damage loss. So don't worry too much about the Rattle the Stars talent. The basic idea of the rotation is spend your astral power as you enter Eclipse. Don't spend too much astral power as you exit the Eclipse to make sure that you have a lot of astral power again when you enter your next eclipse. That's the basic idea of the rotation as it is with these talents. Then let's talk a little bit about AoE. Again, I'm going to show you a talent build that, again, not going to go into too much detail, but the red circles are pretty important talents for AoE. The green talents you can freely switch around because they don't give you such a big damage gain. And then again, purple is utility that you can switch around, but I think it's pretty important. Now, I circled one talent in orange. This is the choice node between Pulsar and Orbital Strike. Now, both Pulsar and Orbital Strike are good for AoE. For sustained AoE, Pulsar is better. But if things die pretty quickly and you don't have time to put Stellar Flare up, and also it's a 2-minute cooldown rather than a 3-minute cooldown on your Incarnation as well, then you can totally go for Orbital Strike. I personally think that playing with Orbital Strike is a lot easier. So at the start, when you start out with dungeons, when you do lower and pluses or whatever, I would definitely recommend to go with Orbital Strike first to make sure you get a little bit of an idea of how Moonkin plays. And once you're a bit better at how Moonkin plays and a bit better at managing your dots and everything, then you can switch to a Pulsar if you think it's better on like higher and plus keys or more consistent AoE damage that is required in a raid or something like that. 
All right, then I'm going to show you an opener for an AoE situation. Usually when there's an AoE situation, mobs are not stacked up instantaneously. They're being gathered by the tank. So that's why during the pull timer, I applied moonfires to basically replicate a situation where the mobs are not gathered up immediately. So once the tank gathers, you put some moonfires on, on the targets. As soon as the mobs are stacked, then you press your sunfire because your sunfire, of course, cleaves to all the targets around your main target. And you don't want to spend too many globals casting Sunfire because it splashes, right? So if you would immediately cast Sunfire, even though the mobs aren't stacked yet, then you have to cast Sunfire again later to make sure it's applied on everything. So you shouldn't be wasting time like that. You make sure you cast Moonfires first as they're gathering up. Once they're gathered, you cast Sunfire to make sure you only need to cast it one single time. Then uh, you cast your cooldowns immediately after you applied your dots. So you apply your sunfires, you apply your moonfires, then you press incarnation or celestial alignment or orbital to strike, depending on which talent you have. And the next thing you do is you immediately dump your astral power into starfalls. Then you cast mushroom because mushroom enables our waning twilight, which is a talent that gives us more damage if we have three dots up. And uh, our mushrooms have... Uh, talent that make it also a dot. So you, after you press your sunfire, your moonfire, and your cooldowns, and you press uh, your starfalls, then you put mushrooms up, then you cast fear balloon, and then you start stellar flaring. Because at this point you have done everything already, right? You've pressed all of your things. You are inside your eclipse, and now we can press stellar flare to basically keep up your winning twilight. Stellar Flare is not incredibly important. A lot of people feel a little bit overwhelmed with Stellar Flare. They feel like, oh my god, I don't have enough time to put this dot up. But just know that everything else that you do is much more important than putting up Stellar Flare. Stellar Flare is just an enabler for winning Twilight, and it generates a little bit more astral power. So this is something that is not as important as all the other things that I mentioned before. So only start casting Stellar Flare if you have nothing else to do. If you don't have to put Moonfires up, if you don't have to cast Starfalls, if you really have no other things that you want to be doing, then you apply Stellar Flare. So definitely keep that in mind. And while you apply your Stellar Flare, so let's say there's 10 targets and you cannot put your Stellar Flare up on everything instantaneously, obviously. So you can use your Mushrooms as like a bridge to make sure your Waning Twilight stays on the targets until you have your Stellar Flare up. So definitely don't cast three mushrooms in a row unless the mobs die incredibly fast and there's no more AoE within the next 30 seconds or something like that. Then you can cast them all at once. But if you need to do consistent AoE damage, then you want to cast one mushroom first, then apply some stellar flares while the dot is running. Then once the dot runs out from your mushroom, you cast mushroom again to refresh your waning twilight and you keep applying stellar flares until you have it on all of them. Once stellar flares on everything, you can use your time to cast starfires. Starfire is the absolute last thing you do if you have absolutely nothing else to do. And you want to refresh your stellar flare, um, I think when it's below eight seconds approximately. So if you see any stellar flares that are below eight seconds, you definitely want to recast stellar flare again, unless the mobs die really quickly, of course, and it's not worth it. But if the mobs still are alive for a decent amount of time, then you refresh your stellar flare on low duration rather than casting starfire, because that will be a bigger gain overall. All right, yeah, the rest of the rotation is just keep your sunfire and moonfire up, which should happen automatically if you run Ethereal Kindling, which is a talent that whenever you cast Starfall, it will extend your dots. So your Sunfire and your Moonfire should stay up automatically. If it's consistent AoE, then you want to never overcap Astral Power. You want to always cast Starfalls. Keep in mind Starfall stacks. Some people are confused about Starfall stacking, like does it do reduce damage if you stack it or, that, or something like that, and no. As soon as you have Starfall ready, you can press it. No matter if you have five Starfalls up or 10 Starfalls up, it doesn't matter. They always do the same amount of damage, so it's totally fine to just stack them. Then you want to enter Lunar Eclipse on single target, uh, on AoE, sorry, if you're outside of an Eclipse. So if your cooldowns are gone, you're outside of an Eclipse, then you want to enter your Lunar Eclipse. 
Make sure you use your mushrooms to proc waning toilet in a staggered way, as I said earlier, to make sure that uh, your waning toilet is always rolling on the targets. Make sure you use your Fury of Loon on cooldown and apply Stellar Flare if there's nothing else to do and cast Starfire if there's really nothing else to do. It sounds complicated, but it's really not as complicated as it might seem. If you look at the rotation that I'm running, uh, you can just see that I'm basically using Stellar Flare as like a filler spell instead of casting Starfire like we did in Shadowlands. So in Shadowlands, we did the same thing, except we didn't have mushrooms to use and we didn't have Stellar Flare. So in addition to how we played in Shadowlands, you just press your mushrooms and you use your Stellar Flare as a filler spell instead of your Starfire. So instead of standing there and just Starfire, 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 you just look at the targets and see, okay, this mob needs Stellar Flare, this mob needs Stellar Flare, this mob needs Stellar Flare. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's go over the gear. So first of all, I want to mention a disclaimer that, of course, this can change with tuning and with changes, so keep that in mind. But if there's no major tuning changes, then the stats that we want is high item level. We want more intellect. Intellect is good. Our best secondary stat is mastery, so you definitely want to go for mastery. All the other stats are not as important as mastery, so you don't really have to worry about them. When in doubt, always sim your character use raid bots and just see which items are better. If you don't know how to sim your characters, I actually made a video about that if you want to check that out. It's really easily explained and it's really easy to understand, so make sure you do that if you want. Then, for your enchants, you want to go with the waking stats on your chest, you want to go with the intellect and stamina enchant on your legs, you want to put mastery on your rings, and you want to go with sophic devotion on your weapon. There's a bunch of utility enchants you can go for as well um, that don't give you player power. You usually go for avoidance on that one because that is really useful in and plus and also in the raids. Then for gems, you want to go with one primary stat plus mastery gem. And you want to go for Mastery plus Haste gems for all of your other gem slots. Then for Trinkets, the best trinket currently, by quite a bit actually, is Furious Rage Feather with drops in them plus. So farming that trinket makes a lot of sense and to upgrade it with Valor also makes a lot of sense. Then other useful trinkets is Whispering Incarnate Icon. This trinket is also really strong for AoE. Then Spiteful Storm is a good trinket, Conjured Chill Globe. Eye of Skavald, Dark Moon Deck Inferno, and Windscar Whetstone is also pretty good, but make sure you sim your character and see which trinkets that you currently have are good for your character. Then there's some good trinkets that are specifically good for AoE, on top of the other trinkets that I already mentioned. One of them is Infernal Writ, which is also pretty good for single target, and then the Alchemy Stone is also pretty good for AoE. But keep in mind that the crafted items require a spark of ingenuity, and those ones are really rare, and you probably don't want to spend it on a trinket because that one cannot be embellished. If you want to learn about what to do with your spark of ingenuity, I made another video about that, so check that out to make sure that uh, you understand how that system works. Then let's talk about crafted gear. So the best in slot list for Moonkin has two crafted items in there. It's the Inscription Staff with Mastery and Haste and the Embellishment Bronze Grip Wrappings and the Jewel Crafter Neck with the Embellishment that is called Elemental Laureate. Now, keep in mind though that this is only best in slot for pure single target. The Bronze Grip Wrappings Embellishment is a single target proc that is not very good on AoE, but only in single target, so keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that the Inscription Staff is a two-hand weapon that costs two sparks. As soon as the raid comes out, you will only have two sparks available, so you cannot craft the Staff and the Jewel Crafting Neck, because that would require three sparks in total. So depending on what you want to do, you can either craft the Jewel Crafting Neck, the Elemental Lariat, immediately, and then wait until you have the third spark and then craft the Inscription Staff, or you can craft the Elemental Lariat, the Jewel Crafting Neck, and use your other spark to craft a one-hand weapon that you put an embellishment on, and then you wait for two more sparks so you can craft the Inscription Staff. So this is a little bit a decision that you have to make, depending on how strong you have to be at the very start of the raid coming out. If you have some time and your, your guild doesn't need you to be fully powered up at the start, then you can wait a little bit for extra sparks. And if you cannot wait, then maybe craft something that is a gain immediately. And um, then later on, once you have infinite sparks available to you, you can craft the best in slot items. Now, when it comes to embellishments, I personally suggest 
that you use one embellishment for the jewel crafting neck, the Elemental Lariat, that is not available yet until the raid comes out. Once the raid comes out, this will be a recipe that drops. This recipe is not in the game yet before the raid comes out, so keep that in mind. And I would recommend for your second item to craft a one-hand weapon. It can be anything. It can be a one-hand dagger. I think there's a mace as well. Either way, whatever one-hand intellect weapon that you can find is fine. Put Master in Haste on it, and then I personally recommend to use the Potion Embellishment. The Potion Embellishment makes your potion last 50% longer, and the reason why I recommend this is because it doesn't have any downsides. It's good in every situation, it's good on one target, it's good on 10 targets, it's good on basically anything, as long as you use a potion. The problem with Bronze Grip Wrappings is that it's good on single target and not good on other things, and the problem with the blue silken lining is that you have to be above 90% HP to get the embellishment enabled. And in my opinion, during progression, you're not going to be above 90% HP a long duration of the fight. So in my opinion, the, the lining is a no-go, blue silica night lining, even though it sims really well, but it only sims really well because in the sim, in the simulation, your character is never going to drop below 90% because it just assumes that you're always on 100%, right? But in reality, you're going to drop below 90% quite a lot, and therefore I do not recommend the lining. I personally think you should go with the jewel crafting neck, the lariat, and a one-hand weapon, or the jewel crafting ring that works as well. If you manage to get a weapon through M+, or through the mythic raid really early on, then you don't have to craft a weapon, you can just craft a ring instead of jewel crafting ring, and you can put the potion embellishment on that one as well. Now, you don't have to listen to me, keep in mind, I'm just kind of feely crafting this. I've seen the numbers on the embellishments from the theory crafters, the Moonkin theory crafters, and in my opinion, it's not worth the extra gain from the other embellishments because of the downsides that they come with. So in my opinion, the potion embellishment plus the jewel crafting lariat is the best. But do whatever you, you think is best and whatever your situation you're in as well, right? And the reason why I suggested the jewel crafting ring is because it's very hard to replace that, right? Because if you craft a jewel crafting ring, even if you're lucky somehow and you get another ring from the raid that is really good, then you don't have to unequip your jewel crafting ring. But if you craft bracers or a belt or whatever, and then you actually have a belt that drops in the raid for you, then you cannot wear both of them, right? So that's why I suggested the ring, and it also comes with the best stats as well, because you can define the stats that are on your ring. All right, now when it comes to consumables, the best potion is the Elemental Potion of Unlimited Power. This potion costs one Primal Chaos, though, and Primal Chaos is something that is not easy to come by at the very start of the raid coming out, because we need so many pr Primal Chaoses to craft our crafted gear, our profession gear. So the cheaper version of this, if you do not have Primal Chaos available for these pots, it's the Elemental Potion of Power. That one does not cost Primal Chaos, but it also gives you less stats. Then the best vials for single target is the Vial of Elemental Chaos. And technically, the Toxic Crit Flask would also be pretty good, but it has downsides, it has a negative effect, so I don't necessarily recommend it for progression or anything like that. For AoE, if you do M+, plus or any sort of AoE rate encounters, then you want to run the Vial of Glacial Fury. So Vial of Elemental Chaos single target, Vial of Glacial Fury AoE. When it comes to food buff, you want to run the Intellect food. If you don't want to spend so much on Intellect food, you can run the Mastery plus Haste food. Alright, so when it comes to professions, there are no direct player power gains from professions, so you don't have to run any professions at all. There are some indirect gains from alchemy because it reduces the toxic effects from toxic flasks and toxic embellishments. And whenever you use a potion, it gets a small heal. But this is not a player power gain, this is a survivability gain. And if you're not running any of these toxic flasks or toxic embellishments anyway, then you don't need this. And engineering would give you the access to wormholes and the access to an additional tinker socket. So if you do a lot of M+, then in addition to the invisibility belt, you could also craft another engineering effect. But keep in mind, you don't need to be an engineer to craft one item with a tinker socket. Then let's go over racials. All the racials are pretty minor gains, so you don't have to play anything at all. You can play whatever you want. But the best racials for a horde would be troll, and the best racial for alliance would be night elf, if you want to choose the best. But again, it's minor gains, so it really doesn't matter that much. Then I posted some macros because unfortunately there's a bug currently. Well, I'm not sure if it's a bug, but either way, you cannot make one macro 
that works no matter which talents you have selected for your cooldowns. So you need to have two different macros that I posted below. One of them is a macro for your cooldowns if you do not have Orbital Strike talented. And one macro is for your cooldowns if you have Orbital Strike talented. Unfortunately, as I said, you cannot make one macro because it just breaks depending on which talents you select. So if you play Orbital Strike, you need to drag that macro into your bar. And if you don't want to play Orbital Strike or you don't currently play it, you drag the other macro into your bar. It's a bit annoying and I hope they fix this, but currently this is the only solution. If you run Convoke, which by the way is something you can run, I didn't mention this before, but on single target you can actually run Convoke. It would technically be the best talent for pure single target. So if you're ever in a situation where you're fighting one single mob and one single mob only, for example in Vault of Incarnates, it's Taros, the second boss, then you can run Convoke and it's actually the best talent. It's better than a running Incarnation in that um, scenario, but only for that situation. And if you run Convoke, then you can run this macro as well because it basically makes you not cancel it. Because so, sometimes when you spam Convoke and you press it multiple times, then it will cancel itself. And that is obviously really bad. So if you run this macro, then no matter how many times you press it, it will not cancel itself, all right? And that's it. I really hope this guide helped you out a little bit to understand like the basic idea of Moonkin. And I hope I gave you enough information about stats and all of that kind of stuff to understand it a bit more. And yeah, I hope you have fun playing Moonkin. I hope you enjoy playing it in a raid and in a plus. And let's all hope for Moonkin buffs because we want Moonkin to be better, of course, right? If you agree, say Moonkin buffs in the comment below, please. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet for more videos like these. Check out my stream over at twitch.tv slash Nagura. If you have any questions, you can ask it there. You can also ask in the comments below. And yeah, have a nice rest of your day. And thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.